Insecurity would have worsened in Nigeria without Buhari says special assistant on media and publicity Femi Adeshina. And calls intensify to prioritize the Sudanese people first as fighting intensifies in the four region. This is Plus Politics. I am Mary Anako. The special assistant on media and publicity to President Muhammad Buhari has said insecurity would have worsened in Nigeria without the president's input. The presidential spokesperson noted that Buhari's administration greatly improved security in Nigeria. According to Adeshina, Buhari surpassed the former president, Goodluck Jonathan, on security because Nigeria's armed forces moved from seventh to fourth place rating in Africa. He further explained that Nigeria's insecurity would have been worse without Buhari's intervention. Meanwhile, ahead of the inauguration, a group under the auspices of the Coalition of Niger Delta Civil Society Groups has called on President-elect Asiwaju Bola Tinubu to also extend the tenor of the interim administration of the presidential amnesty program. Joining us to discuss this is Fine Face Dunamene. Uh, he is the Executive Director, Youth and Environmental Advocacy Center. Thank you so much, Fine Face, for joining us. Good evening. Thank you, Mariano Kuhn, and thank you for having me. Good evening to everyone. Great. Let's start with the uh, position of the presidential spokesperson. Of course, we know that the administration of President Muhammad Buhari is grinding to an end. And uh, if for anything uh, that's worthy of note, the president is really excited to be going home to Dara. But then, of course, we cannot. Uh, but assess the performance of Mr. President over the years, especially for an issue that's a hot topic as insecurity. Now, I'd like to quote, you know, his presidential spokesperson, Femi Adishino. He said, and I quote, that the um, Buhari administration has greatly improved insecurity, um, or rather insecurity has improved greatly under uh, President Buhari's administration. So I'm going to pose that question to you. How greatly uh, has the Buhari administration improved security, uh, and in what ways? Well, thank you very much. I think, um, basically, the primary responsibility of government is to protect lives and properties. And the Buhari administration is not different from any other government, be it at the local government level, state level, or at the federal level. So the president has simply performed his job. But whether or not it has been greatly is what I cannot really be able to confirm that the president has actually reduced insecurity greatly because the most uh, significant thing that happened under the former president, Gulag, really Jonathan administration, were things like the kidnapping of the you know, Chibo girls, uh, the attack of the UN house, and other you know, insurgent activities that sprawled up during that time. But government being a continuum, he has come into office and he has made his own input and contribution towards the mitigation of, you know, the security situation in the country. But that does not mean that under the Buhari administration that we never had incidences of insecurity that affected the country. It is it is a common saying that someone cannot stop a moving train. But that parable has gone underground in Nigeria. That under the Buhari administration. A moving train was stopped by some felonies and some people kidnapped and taken into custody. So we've also had pockets of kidnapping across the country. So he, he may use that uh, you know, analogy of uh, security rating or index that uh, the country is now fourth position instead of seventh position under you know, good luck, Jonathan. But to me, I don't think uh, soft targets are not being targeted. And that single index is not enough to say that... Uh, you know, insecurity has improved greatly. Our train is no longer working on the way today because of the issue of insecurity. So we are not better off. It's not yet a guru. There is nothing we should celebrate. But what we need to do is that we can commend the president. He has tried his own best. He has contributed his quota to the improvement of security, which is why he got into office, taking the oath of office to protect lives and property. But to me, I don't really 100% uh, you know, agree with him that uh, maybe under Buari, 
we are already celebrating a total or uh, great achievement in the area of insecurity. What brings about the a reduction in security is if there is cooperation between the people and the government. So if the presidency have enjoyed some form of uh, you know, cooperation from the people, it's not enough to say it has improved greatly. Now, also look what happened under former President Gulag Kepele Jonathan. There was an increment of work from just about 70-something naira to 90-something naira or thereabouts in 2012. And there was mass protests across the country. But under the Buhari administration, we have work increased from 165 naira to 700, 600, 500 naira. And people cooperated and never went on the street. So if some of those steps were taken, it would have gone a long way to you know, dense the image that is trying to paint now. Answer has happened under this administration. And these are issues that threaten security in the country. So to a very large extent, I won't say that uh, the president performed beyond what others could do. But to a very large extent, I believe that there was some reduction in the way that uh, attacks were happening from across the country compared to under former President Gulak Ebele Jonathan. So I wouldn't just uh, you know, agree with him that under the current administration that uh, it is something we should celebrate 100% because there is a kind of uh, high rating of the Nigerian military from this seventh position to the fourth position or that security has improved. Let, let's look at know, some greatly. statistics. Today, a lot of part of the country are still under siege by insurgents. Let's look at some statistics. I like to go with facts and figures. Um, for a government uh, that, you know, rode into power saying that they were going to deal with insecurity, especially Boko Haram, and of course we've heard the information minister over and over say that Boko Haram has been technically defeated and it's been pushed to the fringes and that at the time uh, when they took power, Boko Haram was occupying local government areas, but now they are no longer occupying um, certain local government areas. But let me give you some statistics on the number of people uh, that have been kidnapped in terrorist attacks in Nigeria from 2017 to 2019. I didn't want to go to all the way back to 2015. Now, uh, in 2019, 390 people were kidnapped in Nigeria in terrorist attacks. Uh, several militant groups um, that, were, that were active in the country um, you know, had attacks both on civil and military targets. We remember this. Um, we also know that um, the kidnapping of 276 female students from a secondary school in Borno, happened in, which happened in 2014, received a global response. But there was another that happened um, under President uh, Buhari. Now, as of January 2021, I must let you know that 112 girls were still missing. Six students were believed to have died. Um, and we also know that... Um, this has so far been um, 2021, I beg your pardon, if I'm not mistaken, um, is the one that has had the most terror-related deaths, according to Statistica. Again, um, there's been a lot of, I think, 1,245 people who have died in Nigeria um, since 2019. Um, based on terrorist attacks, and we have statistics also that despite the overall increase in the number of deaths, Nigeria remains one of the countries with the highest terrorism threat levels in the world. Now, in the year 2021, um, and 2019, I beg your pardon, um, even if the deaths due to ter terrorism ex experienced a decrease, Nigeria's deadly terrorist group Boko Haram became more dangerous, and the number of attacks on both civil and military targets increased. So, yes. It looks like people they killed were reduced, but the attacks were on the increase. So again, we seem to be the only country as we speak right now, according to statistics, that is experiencing a high level of terrorism. And we're not even a war-torn country. So again, it's beautiful for Femi Adishina to say that, oh, well, um, you know, our armed forces have moved a notch higher. But looking at how we're fighting terrorism, could we have done it a better way? We've seen that these people have had the infantry to go into a naval, um, into an army training school and, and attacked. They kidnapped a soldier. We've seen these people hit targets like the presidential convoy, testing the body language of the government. And all we have heard is talking tough, declaring no fly zones. Can we really have Femi Adeshino give this blanket statement in terms of the fight against insecurity? Fine face, yeah, are you there? The statistics that have been dished out, I, I believe, is a product of research and uh, is something that is out there. And I believe that Statistica is a source that can be depended on. But, but looking at the statistics you read out, I don't think anybody should be celebrating uh, you know, greater achievement when this kind of thing still happen 
under this present administration. And, and you know quite well that uh, during the time of Jonathan, attacks of this nature, terrorist attacks of this nature, were something that was alien to Nigeria. And when it was happening, a lot of people were believing that, ah, this kind of thing wasn't part of Nigeria, so a lot of people talked about it. But we are now getting used to this kind of system that we now have. So I think that uh, if we have uh, even uh, kidnapping under Jonathan, uh, taking of the schoolgirls, and it also happened under Buhari, and then you conclude that, okay, for that reason, you know, it, it is best under this administration. I think, in a way, I believe that I can only go ahead to say that, okay, government is a continuum. The president has come. Eight years is about to go. How far has he gone? Well, he has tried his own quota. He has completed his quota for the issue of insecurity, uh, the fighting insecurity in the country. But I do not think that uh, he did better than the previous administration because if the war was as strong as it was under Jonathan, under the current administration, it may have been difficult for you know, President Muhammad Buhari to also be able to manage it. So the insecurity, as I know, is like, is like stress. It's part of us. It's something that we can manage, and it's not something that we can eradicate because it's already part and parcel of the system and the society. And the way it is in Nigeria today, a lot of people don't want the issue of insecurity to die down because that is the oil company of many people, even those who are within the security formation. They know what they're making from that, so they don't want it to go out so that they can continue to benefit. But in I'm, way, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm going to stop, I'm gonna stop you there, fine face. I'm going to stop you there and question you a bit. When you say that there are people in the security business, these are people who are supposed to be law enforcement, helping us to fight insecurity, you're saying on national TV that this is their oil company. In other words, they're really benefiting from it, so it has to continue. Is that what you're saying? Definitely, that is what, that is what I'm saying, and that is the situation. It's just like we have in the Niger Delta. There are security personnel that have been posted to the Niger Delta to fight the issue of crude oil thefts, illegal bunkering, and artisanal refineries. But they are aiding and abating the process, and that continues. So in as much as you have people who are benefiting from a system as part of that process of fighting that system, the system will never go down. So the, the reason why you continue to have insecurity, and even at the level it is now, is that if it reduced to a very large extent, a lot of people who benefit from that, those processes will not be able to benefit from that. Just like we have the issue of uh, you know, pipeline vandalism, good oil tech, and illegal bunker in the Niger Delta. No matter how you fight it, you still see it surfacing because the security personnel that are posted to the Niger Delta to fight the issue of crude oil tech are allegedly aiding and abating this whole process is, and that is why it has to continue because people are making that their oil company, they are making that their tapping point, they are making that the alternative source of revenue at the expense of the society, at the expense of the country, at the expense of the image and the name of the country. So you continue to have this system running. So that is happening because uh, if, if look at how much they make from Boko Haram, look at what happens when that happens. So a lot of things are happening, and I believe that they know what I'm talking about, and they believe. And they know that it is the truth because a lot of people are benefiting from it. They wouldn't want it to go down because if it goes down, where are they going to continue to drill their oil? Where they make a lot of money from? So they need to be able to work according to the tenets and the rules of engagement of their offices and ensure that we have a reduced security incidences across the country because the name we are getting is something that I don't think anyone is proud of. Okay. Let's talk about the handling of the issue of terrorism and insecurity in general in this country. Uh, there, is, there, there seems to be a lot of, uh, you know, tough talking and, um, you know, speech giving as opposed to the action plan that is on the ground. Um, I have also spoken to several, you know, officers who are in the, you know, in the theater of warfare and many of them have not given great reports as to how, you know, they have been treated in, you know, this fight against insecurity. But let, let me take you back to... Former President Goodluck Jonathan's um, cry for help at some point when he said that there were saboteurs in his government and he felt that there were people who were aiding and abating Boko Haram, sponsors of Boko Haram in his administration. Now, fast forward to the Buhari administration. Our country is a country that's facing this terrorism and insecurity. Um, where we ought to have, one way or the other, found the finances of this, you know, insecurity. But then countries like Dubai were able to give us a list of people who were financing the, this, you know, insecurity. What has the Buhari government done till today? We've not heard anything about that particular list or the financiers. And Buh President Buhari at some point also pointed to the fact that there might be people in government, powerful people, elites, who may be sponsoring this insecurity. But what has been done? How well has the Buhari administration handled this? I mean, because this is one of the reasons why we voted 
the Buhari administration into power because many had thought that the Good Luck Jonathan administration did not handle this insecurity and terrorism issue. So how well did they do in terms of that handling? Yeah, uh, uh, uh. That's, that's exactly the situation. In fact, uh, what former President Gulag Ebele Jonathan said when he said that uh, Boko Haram has infiltrated his government and you cannot really distinguish from, you know, those who are in from those who are not in it. confirms the fact that there are people that are benefiting from the security in Nigeria. So we have, you know, conflicts entrepreneurs, you know, in Nigeria, those who benefit and make money from conflict. Now, look at the Buhari administration. What has actually generally changed in terms of how the former president managed the issue of insecurity and had this administration is managing the issue of insecurity. They are located to the army. They buy weapons for them. They also try the much they could. But does the money trickle down there? That is why I also challenge Nigerian media. That we, we, we should go down to talk to the people at the theater of war. They will be able to tell you what is really happening and what is running on ground. Investigative journalism is very, very key. For us to really know the effort and the step that is being taken by the previous administration and the current administration in the fight against insurgency, insecurity across the country. What I think addresses the issue of insecurity and insurgency or whatever is the cooperation of the citizen to volunteer information to security operatives that they can use to counter some of this violent extremism, insurgency, and all these terrorist attacks that we have around. But if, if, if you don't have that, it becomes an issue. I know that one of the things that helped the Gwari administration somehow was uh, you know, rolling out certain uh, you know, social, uh, uh, social uh, security schemes you know, that put some stipends in the pocket of some people who may not have had that and may have also reduced the way they go into the issue of uh, you know, creating security issues across the country. But, but to a very large extent, it is not yet time for us to celebrate. We still need to work together as a people who volunteer information, work with the people, gather intelligence, invest into research i don't think we research in this country especially people that are in authority the moment they are on the dining table you don't see them spend more time spend more resources to gather information other countries spend so much to gather intelligence and it is only through intelligence gathering and sharing of information that we can be able to win the war against you know insecurity in nigeria but if we continue to stay in our offices make a lot of comments send money and we don't monitor how the money is spent to procure you know, you know, uh, military software and hardware, then it becomes an issue. How much are we able to even pose the morale of the security personnel we post to the field there? And a lot of them are having a lot of these issues and they don't even have a way of challenging their problems. So I think that the Gwari administration have tried its best, but its best is not enough because we are not yet where we should be at uh -huh. this point in time. Because if you look at the promises that were made by the Gwari administration in 2015, when he came into power, I was going to tackle insecurity and eradicate insecurity. That very language of eradicating security came. And I also came, for, came to the public and said, you cannot eradicate insecurity. You can minimize and reduce insecurity, but you cannot eradicate it. But it's part and parcel of the entire system. Five so, what do you think is the major no, challenge? What do you think the major challenge of government is? And I'm not just talking about the Bahari administration, because it seems like it's the same question I could have asked if, you know, under the Johnson administration. What do you think the major challenge is in terms of naming, shaming, and prosecuting these people? Because, I mean, if, if a country like the UAE was able to tell us that these are some of the people they found to be p people who are financing, that could have been a, 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 you know, a, a thread of sorts that could have linked us if we were serious about it. So what exactly do you think the challenge is in dealing with this issue? What's, the, what's stopping our government, especially a Buhari administration that everyone looked at as a, you know, a no-nonsense government that would deal with this issue once and for all? What is stopping the Buhari administration or any other administration to tackle the issue of insecurity, even when they know those who are perpetrating this, is lack of political will and lack of capacity on the part of government to demonstrate that leadership such that they can take the issue of insecurity by the horn. So they also understand and they know that the process that brought them to power, one or two persons whose names have been mentioned as being part of the process of creating insecurity for the country is in there. So they are afraid of taking on the person because they don't want to step on toes. And unless we begin to fight insecurity head on, without any sacred cow, without no matter how highly placed the person could be, when you are linked to the issue of insecurity, you are taking on. That is the only way we can be able to reduce the issue of insecurity to the barest minimum. You can imagine what the UAE did, naming some persons that are allegedly sponsoring the insecurity and terrorism in Nigeria. 
But Nigeria never took steps to investigate those people. They never took steps to, 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 to a kind of check, prosecute those people. And, and I tell you, after God, the next all-knowing institution we have is the government. Because the president receives security briefing from across the country every day. And he understands from different security formations, from the DSS to the police to the army to the, the, the Navy to the Air Force to the Nigerian Security and Civil Defense Corps, and just name them. The president has security information filtered to him every day. And he knows who does what, how, when, and where. And we also have our, our phone lines that have been uh, you know, uh, 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 tapped to a very large, large extent because a lot of People that are at the level that they can create the issue of uh, insecurity in Nigeria are politically exposed. And mm. we have all these things done, but, but they are unable to tackle the issue of insecurity. I think government needs to summon that political will, not minding anybody that is you know, highly placed in the country and try as much as it can to prosecute, investigate and prosecute anybody that they said or found to have been contributing to the issue of insecurity in this country. Because why they are smiling to the bank because they are conflict entrepreneurs. Others are going to the grave sad. Others are going to their home destroyed. Others are going and crying because their people have been killed. Others are crying because their people have been kidnapped. And a lot of people are unable to go about their normal businesses. And it's making the foreign missions to labor and list Nigeria as no-fly zone, advising their citizens that the country is a hot zone, people should not enter, it's, it's painted red. So it's a big problem. I, I have experienced a situation in this country whereby a senior citizen of the UK wanted to come to uh, uh, this, the South South. And the person was advised not to come to the South South. South South is under security threat area. That place is not safe. So it become an issue for the person to come in. So what causes this? I, I think we need to take steps to you know, address this issue. And the government is the right person because the resources is there, the intelligence is there, the political will should also be there to address the issue of insecurity mm. so that we can have a safer environment where investments can thrive, business can thrive, and people can go about their businesses and be able to enjoy their lives the way they want to enjoy it without any fear of being attacked, fear of being kidnapped, or fear of terrorist attack within the area they go to. So I think that intelligence gathering is very, very key. Government should summon you know, courage to use political will to drive the process of providing security for Nigerians, because the primary responsibility of government is the provision of uh, protection of lives and property. And that is what the government should do, because the resources is there for the government to do so. Let me ask uh, a quick question before we go to the amnesty part of this conversation. Now, um, we've seen millions, if not billions, put into fighting insecurity. So let's not talk about this without talking about the army and accountability. Monies have been, I mean, when it comes to security monies, including security votes, it seems to be shrouded in some level of secrecy. So even when the National Assembly is asking questions, we barely get to get answers. And of, of course, these monies belong to us, the taxpayers, and it is our right to know how these monies are being used, if they're being put to, right, to good use. We've seen, like I said, I have had conversations with people who are fighting in the theater of war. I have spoken with soldiers um, in, in different parts of the North who um, are in the Operation Safe Corridor, in Hadinkari, and all of those operations. Um, most of the, the, the most common denominator is that most of these people are not armed with the right kind of ammunition to fight these terrorists. Don't forget, half the time these things are reported, we hear that these terrorists have superior, you know, firepower compared to what mm -hmm. we're giving our people. And it, aside from the firepower, what is the welfare of these men and women? Because they are, whether we like it or not, protecting us and our borders. And if they're protecting us, putting their lives on the line, what are we doing to make sure that they themselves are protected and, and they have something that can keep them going, encouraging them you know, in the fight against insecurity. How well have we done in terms of that, and how do we get accountability from the army? Yeah, to a very large extent, um, I think that they hardly want to disclose security, you know, budgets. But in some other clients, you can just go, go online and you can find how much the United States, the United Kingdom are spending on security. What they may not do is to actually break down to tell you the nitty-gritty of what the money is being spent for. But to a very large extent, if you have reason to seek for that information, they can give it to you. Like in Nigeria, we have the Freedom of Information Act that can grant people access to such information. But in a way, they are also being careful 
that maybe if they make those information available and to the public that some of those salaries, the criminals, the uh, you know insurgent they are fighting may have access to that information and going to plan a counter which will affect their operations. So they are also trying not to make that available. But to an extent, citizens that are where men can be able to get this information. And I know quite well that if government is trying to, you know, fight insecurity the way they are attempting to do, even using the security vote, which has been a controversial issue, they can do it. I think that the resources they need to fight insecurity is there. And insecurity is something that they put more money to than most other things that you can ever think of because when they attempt to you know, carry out the fun function of government that has to do more with uh, you know protection of lives and property, they try to put in some more money to get their job done. We need to boost the moral of our you know soldiers who are at the theater of war. These are fathers, these are uncles, these are brothers and husbands, and a lot of people are like you know trying to see how they can also be well taken care of. Oftentimes, when funds are released to take care of them at that level, oftentimes they, they doesn't get to them. And again, they they, are, they they have the training, but the equipment to use and fight is not always readily available to them. Oftentimes, we've heard when we hear that uh, the, 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 the type of guns that the terrorists they go to fight have is more than what our security operatives have. And a lot of time, they fall to those uh, you know, superior gun, not because they have superior firing power, but because they have better gun than the security people have. So everything needs to be overhauled. There should be the overhauling of our security architecture to be able to drive the process of having 21st century policing and security and defense for the country. And that is why we need to train and retrain our personnel to, and to giving them that modern training and capacity to be able to counter insurgency and counter terrorist uh, actions and other you know, security threats that we have across the country. So it's fundamental that we bring our security personnel up to date with what we have. And that is why training and retraining is very, very important for us to boost their, boost their morale. And if any of them happens to lose their life, allegedly, the people, the families should be able to feel the impact of you know, them going to the theater of war to put him on. Because when people are not taken care of, they are unable to be patriotic and do more and put their lives on the line to defend other people. So I commend the military and all others who are at the theater of war fighting to making other, all of us that are in the hinterland to have a safer society. And I think government should do more to appreciate them for what they are doing. Finally, fine face, before, before I let you go. Um, talking about the amnesty program, a group is calling for an extension of the tenor uh, of you know the, the guy who's at the helm of affairs. But before you answer that, uh, what do you perceive the body language um, of the president-elect and whoever um, is in charge of security and the people that he surrounds himself? What do you think it would be in terms of dealing with that? Because, of course, we saw the heightened level of insecurity, tension, violence during the election, the election that, of course, he emerged from. And we've seen, even after the election, um, a resumption of all of the terrorist activities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, how do you uh, presume he's going to deal with this? Is it something that he will prioritize from your perspective? And again, um, talking about prioritizing things, will this amnesty program be top on his agenda? Yeah, I think uh, the president-elect, uh, Senator Ahmed Bolatinubu, is going to prioritize security issue. Is going to also look into the issue of the presidential amnesty program. Why I think so is that looking at his body language, he understands that this is what Nigerians want at this point in time to address some of these issues. And I think uh, the president-elect also understands that uh, if you look at how he emerged president, there were four major political parties that ran the election. We have the Labour Party, we have the you know, uh, People's Democratic Party, the PDP, then we have the APC, then we have the NNPP. If you put the votes of the PDP with that of the Labour Party and that of the NNPP, you will see that the vote is more than the vote that, you know, the president-elect used to win the election. So every other vote that didn't go to him means that those people don't want him and they never wanted him to become president. So I think what he's going to do is to see how he can appease those people by making sure that he does things that people want, to, uh, want him to do and things that will make Nigerians to be happy with him. So looking at him from that perspective, I think he's not going to take any action that will be so drastic, so 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 to, so tense that people will begin to talk about it and there will be action across the country. Okay. So he may decide to look at the presidential amnesty program and then address it because the Niger Delta people want that program to continue so that we continue okay. to have a safer Niger Delta for the oil to continue to flow. 
All right. Well, Fine Face uh, Dumna Nene is uh, the Executive Director, Youth and Environmental Advocacy Center. Thank you so much, Fine Face, for speaking with us. We appreciate it. Thank you, Mary Ann. Good evening to everyone. All right. Up next, we turn our attention to Sudan as the countries across the world evacuate their citizens to safety. Stay with us.